if you're going to manage, you've got to be with your boys through thick or thin. What a great managerial performance. I am in love with what he's been able to do. Legitimate manager of the year. AJ Hinch doing all the right things. Carlos Mendoza needs to get some credit. And he's pressing the right button. Q's had his best year. Murph has done an amazing job. I love the way this team plays the game. I love these guys. They're so much fun to watch. Mike Schilt doing a marvelous job. I'll take this group any day of the week. Welcome everyone to the 2024 BBWAA Manager of the Year Award Show. Inside Studio 21, it's Greg Amsing with Ron Darling. And for the first time ever, we have a guy that actually won this award before. He's one of three managers to win it four times. I'm not done, Buck. Not done. Uh, He's the only manager to win this award with four different teams in four different decades. That is incredible. Buck Showalter, welcome to the show. How are you? Good, and what happened? To, hey, be careful about winning this award, okay? There's two sides of that. <laughs> what, is, what is the experience like for the six men that are going to be right, ready to be interviewed? I, I'll right tell you this. Hour. First of all, they come in your house, okay. okay, and they plug all these things in and for an hour or two beforehand. Your family's sitting around and everything, and this is what kills me. I'm almost nervous for these guys because four of them, they're just going to go, up. Oh, you lost, pull the plugs, walk out. <laughs> and you, your family's sitting there, hey, 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 hey. Now, that's painful, okay. but you know, I, I'm nervous for them a little bit because I know uh, they'll try to downplay it a little bit. It's such an organizational award. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, uh, you know, you're sometimes given to the team that surprises the most. In this case, I think they had a lot of obstacles to overcome. I'm just so proud of watching these guys work this year. Most people think they're leaders. They're not. <laughs> so very few people, very few people are leaders yeah. of men. And that's what these guys are here. They all had inherent problems during the course of the year. They dealt with it better than most. I, I liked another point you made before the show started, and there's only 15 of these in each league. That's right. I mean, it's the most prestigious award for them, but it really marks a chance of, of matching what they know, all the information with the human side. How do I take care of my ball players over a six-month period? Let's begin on the American League side of the brackets. Your three finalists for American League Manager of the Year in alphabetical order. A.J. Hinch of the Tigers led them to their first playoff appearance since 2014. Second worst on-base percentage of any team to ever make the postseason. It was right at 300. Only the 68 Cardinals were worse. First 118 games, they won 55 games under 500. Last 44, 31, and 13. He pushed all the right balls when he needed to. Matt Quattraro of the Kansas City Royals led KC to their first playoff appearance since 2015 after losing a franchise record tying 106 games in 2023. That was the most losses by any team in the prior season to make the postseason in Major League Baseball history. Matt Quattraro is one of your finalists for American League Manager of the Year. And rookie skipper Steven Vogt. Yeah, he didn't look like it. First season as a big league manager, replacing future Hall of Famer Terry Francona. The American League ranks of his bullpen were just astounding best uh, ERA in the AL saves most 53 comeback wins 42 also the most uh, a 26 and 19 record in one run games all three guys are kind enough to join us now uh, welcome to the three of you Matt I want to begin with you I was in spring training with your club and Yonder Alonso and I were just taken aback by the the air of confidence that was exuding from your team and you added as well you guys felt like you were going to have a magical year. How did you instill such confidence fresh off a 106 loss season like that? Well, I think a lot of things go into it, but going back to what Buck said, I mean, it's an organizational, um, it's an organizational thing. It's, a, it's, we had organizational meetings last year. We set the tone in the off season for what our belief system was, uh, you know, from scouting to player development, all those, all the different departments coming into play. And truthfully, when we stepped into foot, uh, step foot into the complex and surprise this spring and the guys, especially the new guys that came in, they said, we're not talking about last year. That's over. That had nothing to do with us. We're moving forward. And we, we were really confident in the talent in there, but more so than anything than the people. 
AJ, I tell you, I remember talking to you, you know, not not long after you left Houston, and you reached out to a lot of people, and you just wore a lot of things that probably uh, actually wasn't really fair to you. But I don't want to talk about vindication, but you know, I sit here and I see you sitting here right now, and all the baseball people that have been pulling for you to, to make sure people are aware again what a good baseball man you are. I mean, how, what kind of feeling do you have going into tonight after the season y'all had? Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And, and you know, I love this job. I love the people that I come to work with every day and work for. And, and you know, there's 30 of us, as you've said, and, and, it, and it's, it is a great group of guys that, that all kind of have this common shared belief on what you got to do to try to get your team ready. I'm so proud of our team and our year and our coaches and our resilience um, and our ability to play the whole schedule and see what happens after you, you post 162 times that led us to the playoffs it's been our identity and and as the manager when you see that flourish um you're just so proud for so many people and 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 enjoy every minute coming to the ballpark hey voter congratulations to you and the organization but i wanted to understand just off the field what are some of the positives of just coming off the field and having to deal with your roster and what are some of the challenges yeah, I mean, first of all, it's an honor to be here and to be up here with these other two um, awesome guys that I've gotten to know really well. And I think some of the things that challenged me was I've never done this. You know, I was a year removed from the field when I got the job, and I'm so thankful to the Cleveland organization and the coaching staff and the players for helping me get up to speed. But, you know, I think some of the things that really helped me were I just got done playing with a lot of younger players. Like, I just got done playing myself. So I knew what it felt like to be going through struggles. I knew what it felt like to be going through good times. And I just think it gave me the ability to really relate to our guys. And, man, did they play well, and they were so much fun to watch all year long. Q, one of the most difficult parts of your job is you have one of the best older players in the league. You have probably one of the best and brightest young players and Bobby Witt Jr. in the league. How do you deal with everything in between and being that person that takes care of those players during the course of the season? Well, you can sign me up every day of the week for that problem to figure that out. I mean, Salvi's, Salvi's remarkable. Uh, you know, what he means to the organization, to the city, to the fans. Uh, he, he is second to none in the way he goes about it and his professionalism. Um, you know, and Bobby, uh, you know, just the talent speaks for itself on the field, but he's even a better person behind the scenes. Uh, the players gravitate to him like, like he's a little brother in some cases because he is younger than them, but they're following his lead at the same time. And, you know, those guys, along with the guys we added to the organization with the professionalism and the playoff experience, these guys were so fun to be around every day. They inspired me. They inspired the coaching staff. They inspired the whole organization to come to work and, and to have as much fun as they did every day. Hey, Steven, listen, I, I look at you guys, three catchers, okay, background. You got all from the same division. You're being real nice to each other right now. You've been trying to beat each other's brains out <laughs> all season. I got it. I got it, okay? And But, you know, you look at your path. I, I love looking at managers' bio and their path, and usually they, they have certain things. When you look back at your path, Steven, whether it be a bullpen coach, whether it be a player, whether it be, you know, where you came from as an amateur or, or who you were around – was there a moment where you said, you know, I can do this, and you gleaned the most uh, knowledge from that experience? Yeah, I, I, th I felt like with the way my path was, being a, you know, a senior draft out of an NAIA school, I never thought playing would really work out. You know, I wanted to keep working and, and fight to get there. I always believed I could, but I tried to learn as much as I could, and that started with my first manager in pro ball, Matt Cotraro, actually. Uh, in short season and low A. And so I learned so much from every single coach, manager, teammate that I had along the way. And about 2018, when I was with the Brewers, you know, that's when I really realized, I think I can do this. And I really just focused on how I could get better and how I could get my teammates better and learn as much as I could. And, and here we are. AJ, uh, we hear the expression buying in all the time. But, man, I, I had a hard time buying in sometimes the stuff you were doing. I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> Sitting on TV, I carry Carpenter. It's a bomb against Class A in Game 2 of the Division Series. Game 5, you lose. The season's over. He's not in the starting lineup. How hard was it for you to get this group to buy into your method? Yeah, you know, I think I think part of that, well, first off, Game 5, like, he'd hurt his hamstring, so I can't take a bullet for that <laughs> one. But I, will, I will take a lot of bullets along the way in this job. But, I, you know, I um, – 
I think I think it all starts with the with the culture that you, that you have that that everything matters and that day you're going to bring it to try to beat the other side and and I watch it across the league I watch a lot of managers have their their fingerprints on teams because they know their personnel the best and 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 when you understand that some of the moves you make some of the non moves you make some of the the advice you get some of the advice you get that 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 you don't use um it's all part of the bigger picture of trying to win that day's game and so if we all start the day with what does it take to win that day's game um everybody will be open to to the idea that that you might have to do things creatively you might have to do it a little bit differently you might need one guy one day and somebody else the next day we had a team full of guys that were willing to do anything to, to win that day's game and that that was pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and honestly, I, I w it drives me crazy to watch group think in Major League Baseball. You, it was refreshing to watch you make the decisions that you were making. So outside the box, so fun. A.J. Hinch, Matt Quattaro, Stephen Vogt, congratulations on a tremendous season. Stick around. One of you will be named 2024 American League Manager of the Year. When we come back, let's talk about the adversity all three of these guys had to overcome to get to this stage here tonight. That's next on MLB Network. Welcome back to the 2024 BBWAA Manager of the Year Award Show. Back with Buck and Ron. Let's talk about the adversity and some of the struggles that these managers had to overcome or focused on the American League side. Begin with A.J. Hinch. I think they were the Cinderella story of Major League Baseball. That should bode well for him because of the way they turned things around the last 44 games. Buck, I don't know how you make it to the playoffs in the modern game with Universal DH now when your team's on base percentage is 300 collectively how do you win games that way it's tough you better have good pitch you, you better have good karma let's face it what these guys are there's certain things you are responsible for it's the atmosphere that you have these guys work in you know there's no excuses okay this we don't have a starting pitcher tonight there's no excuse you go on business as usual I think setting the tone for how your team appro approaches adversity is key and, and I think it's obvious all three of these guys kept a real even kill there because the sky is falling all the time if you let it. You know, you're around people all the time that are telling you, their wives are telling them about this on Twitter and whatever. You've got to have a safe haven when these guys come to the park, and there's got to be consistency in the way you approach the game. That's how you overcome these things, and all three of these guys accomplish that. You know, it's uh, there's different ways to win in baseball. We saw in the World Series with the Dodgers and the Yankees, unbelievable star power. Five great players can get you there. Well, a lot of teams don't have that, and they have to use the full 26-man roster plus, plus guys from AAA to form like a 40-man group that's somehow going to get you over the edge. And I think that's what Detroit did better than most. And they also did something that is pretty remarkable. They rode one of the best starting seasons any pitcher has ever had. Yep. So it was win day at least every fifth day, and they figured it out the other four. It was remarkable that they were able to do that. You know, one of the keys for managing is your what ifs. You know, okay, you never stop and go, oh gosh, if this guy goes down, the season's over. It doesn't. They don't stop and wait for your injuries to go away. The season continues. So your what ifs, they may be in AAA, it may be on the bench, it may be uh, maybe a relief pitcher pitching there. That's what you're responsible for. When you take a pitcher out of the game and you bring somebody in, you've got to be thinking, what's going to happen if he gets hit with a line drive on the first pitch? Yeah. You know, what's happening is happening. You've got, you got to be ready with the what ifs because you're responsible for that. i, I got to be honest. The, to watch Matt Cutraro manage a 106-loss team mm. and then manage an entire season, well, Ronnie, that Royal team didn't look anything like that 106-loss team. I don't think I've ever seen a Jekyll and Hyde back-to-back -back season like that. Well, what's interesting about that, that was Matt's first season. So the ultimate mulligan for him, him and the organization to come from 106 losses. Um, you said before it's an organizational award. I think what you saw is that they made some good moves uh, before the season started to add to Salvi Perez, to add Bobby Witt Jr. But also, they developed players in the big leagues as the season's going along. That's what you have to do when you don't have all the old studs that play every single day. And then Ersig. Adding him the deadline. at the deadline changed that bullpen. He almost became automatic. When he came in games that wasn't only an inning, he could go an inning plus because of his repertoire of pitches. And he was nasty. And I think it gave that entire bullpen kind of a different feel. Everyone moved a, a notch down, which changed uh, how, how their, the outcome.
When you, you know, when you ask guys to play the game a certain way, at some point they got to get a return for it. And when they started getting return for it, they really bought in. And But most important, too, is that your best players have to play the game right. And that's what happened, I know, with Kansas City. All these clubs, you can go to uh, Ramirez with Cleveland. You, you know, there's somebody on every club, their best player played the game right, Ronnie. Yeah, and, the, and one thing that's kind of lost in this is that adding Walker, Michael Walker, and Seth Lugo brought a professionalism to that starting staff. Guys that took the ball, if you're a young pitcher, you could wa watch them go about their business, get it done each and every day, and they got the ball deeper into games than most teams. Yeah, uh, managers will put a feather in their cap based on how they manage a bullpen, and no one did it better based on the statistics than Stephen Vogt. Best bullpen in the sport, and the, the numbers are there for the American League ranks. They were automatic. He was terrific at that. But he needed his bullpen to be great. Going into spring training, Shane Bieber, Tristan McKenzie, his projected one-two, he didn't get any production from those guys. Oh, by the way, he's filling in as a first-year manager for a future Hall of Famer and Terry Francona. Uh, Buck, that's a lot to overcome for a rookie yeah, it, It's like chicken or the egg, you know. Okay, were they really good relievers, or were they? Did he use them right? I think it was both. You know, not being, not having to overextend guys and making sure that they pass the baton. But in order to have this chain in your bullpen, the chain can't have a weak link. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's was amazing. What happened there? There was no weak link except for the playoffs a little bit. We all know how with some of that. But you know. That chain was so solid that there really wasn't a break in it, and it made leads matter, which meant a lot for the morale of a club. When you're constantly losing leads late in the game, it wears on a team. But when leads matter after the sixth inning, you get you have a lot of confidence. It doesn't hurt also that your closer, who had one of the best years in the history of the game, went four games in a row two times during the season. Think about An that. unheard of stat in today's game. And he's the leader of a bullpen that featured a lot of rookie relievers. Right. A lot of rookie relievers in that pen. It was the best in the sport. We're going to step aside. Uh, we're almost there. One of these three guys will find out if they are the 2024 American League Manager of the Year. The news comes your way right after this. Who will take home the American League Manager of the Year Award? Will it be A.J. Hinch, Matt Cotraro, or Steven Vogt? Three worthy finalists who are standing by. Now, the announcement's going to come from a guy that's won this award three times in his illustrious managerial career. Former world champion, won it in 2008 for the very first time with the Tampa Bay Rays. Obviously won the World Series with the Chicago Cubs. Joe Madden is kind enough to join us live on MLB Network. Joe, good to see you. Uh, you add so much to a show like this, so we appreciate your time. You. But take me back to the first time mm -hmm. you won this award. We have three finalists that have never won this honor before. So when you won it in 2008, what did that mean to you? Well, it meant a lot, obviously. It's uh, all, may all your surrealisms come true. It's uh, kind of one of those things that you, it's very hard to believe, believe that you actually achieved this. But as Buck said earlier, it is an organizational award, and I definitely thought that too. All right. Well, uh, without further ado, Joe Baden, give us the big news. Yeah, I've been sitting on this for a bit. And uh, for the 2024 AL Manager of the Year Award, uh, somebody, I think all these candidates, I've known everybody on both sides, but this guy particularly, former player, former teammate, uh, and I think he was built for this position. When he actually got the job, I was very pleased and happy, and I thought he would do wonderfully, and that would be Mr. Stephen Vogt. Well done, voter. Stephen Vogt. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. <laughs> you got it, buddy. Uh, Joe, is there anything else you'd like to say to your former player? Yeah, he does the best impression of me that I've ever seen. Not that it's worth anything. <laughs> we got to get you some know. of that. Yeah, uh, we used to have like these little uh, uh, events at spring training and voter would come in on a bicycle with my glasses on, a, a fungo back, he'd get off and he'd start using like uh, 10 syllable words in front of everybody and his knee would be up on the fungo like Cookie Ross taught me. So it was that excellent stuff. Excellent. That is great. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Uh, before great we job. jump great into job, the, uh, the uh, interview, let's mm -hmm. see the voter results. Stephen Vogt got 27 first place votes. Matt Quattro had the second most with two. Uh, this wasn't as close as we thought it would be. Steven Vogt is your American League Manager of the Year after his first year managing in the big league. Steven, congratulations. What does this honor mean to you right now? Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel right now. Um, I, first, I just have to thank the Dolan family, Chris Antonetti, Mike Turnoff, Matt Foreman, 
uh, the Cleveland organization, uh, the, the entire front office, but my coaching staff, uh, Craig Albernez, Carl Willis, Sandy Alomar Jr., Kai Correa, I can't name them all, but I wouldn't be here without those people and most importantly, the players. Uh, the players did this. Uh, it has, has very little, as you know, Buck, um, if the players don't do what they're capable of, th th this wouldn't be possible. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think everybody's happy for you because you have such a great reputation as a people person, you know, fallen Terry Francona. I hear your family in the background. You know, yeah. Man, there must be, a, must be a bonus in the uh, contract there for winning manager of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yay. Yeah, the kiddos Perfect. are pretty pumped, that's for sure. So win, who do we have? Win, lose, wow. or draw, they're with you, right? Or tie. Yeah, that's right. So we have Peyton, my daughter, Hi. and then Clark and Bennett, my boys. So Perfect. Big Guardians fans. Congra congratulations <laughs> to all of you. I hear you. Thank you so much. You know, Stephen, I was just wondering, you know, one of the toughest uh, jobs, of course, in leading young men is to have that strong leadership, but also the empathy for the endurance that you have to have uh, in a six-month season playing every single day. Where, where did you get that strength from? I, you know, it started early with my, my dad and my mom. Um, you know, my dad was my coach from the time I was four yeah, I until I left high school. And he, um, you know, he, he just always taught me to put my teammates ahead of myself. And if you're going to be the teammate you're capable of, you're going to end up where you want to be. And I've just tried to live that my entire life and my entire career. And I learned a lot of those leadership accolades from my father. It looks like uh, being a manager of the big leagues is your second favorite job. Because, uh, <laughs> you're good at being a dad, too, my friend. Don't I? <laughs> no, I appreciate it. We're, we're having a good time as a family right now, that's for sure. Go celebrate. Stephen Vogt, your American League Manager of the Year. Congratulations again, okay? Yay! Thank you guys. Oh, that's amazing, right? Don't come to me anymore. Oh, I'm my goodness. Up. I'm all choked up. Oh, my. The emotions to see the family surround him like that. Look at this. Look at a young Buck Showalter in 1994 on the list of youngest manager of the year winners by age. Rocco Baldelli was the youngest, then Buck. Tony LaRusso in 83, and of course, what we just yeah. saw from hey. Stephen Boat. Yeah, and when the Boat youngsters jump into the shot, Buck, that was great producing uh, by you. I can't talk. I'm yeah, telling you, you're right. the one that's in the up on air. You're locking me up here. I'm, I'm, I'm having a moment. <laughs> we still have more show. I'm we have done. another award, I'm Buck. Done. When we come back, we're going to jump into the National League side. That's next on MLB Network. BBWAA Awards Week continues Wednesday, the Cy Young Award, and then the big crescendo Thursday night. The MVP all shows at 6 p.m. Eastern right here on MLB Network. Back inside Studio 21, it's Greg with Ron and Buck. We just watched Stephen Vogt win AL Manager of the Year in his first year as a skipper. We have three finalists on the NL side who are in this gig for the first time with their respective team. That's not an easy thing to do, right? Yeah, but I don't really look at it that way, Greg, because I, you know, I knew Murph when he was at Arizona State when I first saw him. I knew he was going to be good. You know, I, Carlos, we've been hearing about him for years. He's going to be a major league manager. Gosh, he was a bench coach with the Yankees. He knew what he was getting into. She'll spin over with St. Louis in a volatile situation, survived it, showed him everybody what a great baseball man he is. They've been managing situations their whole life, but now this was a different stage. I'll agree with you. Yeah, they've been winners their whole life. I think Schilt uh, being able to kind of get that second chance at the job and doing what he did. Pat Murphy, of course, had to replace a guy that was going to the rival, the Chicago Cubs, and make it happen with a young team that lost a lot of players. Mm -hmm. And Mendoza, New York. I don't have to say anymore. No, you don't. No, you don't. Let's uh, dive into what these three men did. Your finalists in alphabetical order for NL Manager of the Year. Carlos Mendoza, like I said, first year with the Mets. Improved them by 14 wins from the 2023 season. Best record in one-run games, 28-16 and 16 in the majors. That, that matters. Third most comeback victories in all of Major League Baseball. Carlos Mendoza, a finalist for NL Manager of the Year. Pat Murphy, his first full season as skipper with the Milwaukee Brewers. He was the longtime bench coach for Craig Council. He really led a terrific bullpen. Best in the National League in ERA. Second most saves with 53. Uh, they ran the base as well. Second most in the National League. He used 17 different starting pitchers. Tied for the most in a season in Brewers franchise history. And Mike Schilt, in year one as manager of the San Diego Padres, led the them to an 11 win improvement over the 2023 team uh, when they won 82 games. Second best record in a full season in Padres history. Only in 1998 Padres had more. And all three managers kind of to join us here live on MLB Network. Uh, Mike Schilt, I want to start with you. Um, I, the two years you spent in the front office with the San Diego Padres, 
What did that teach you and get you ready for this second opportunity with the Friars as manager? Well, first of all, grateful and um, get a great opportunity to work with A.J. Preller. I worked on the field, got a chance to get back into something that I'm passionate about and player development. Also, to perspective, just how front offices work. During that time, I was able to connect with Peter Seiler, God rest his soul, um, and, and learn more about the ownership piece and, and see a bigger picture of how our game operates. So it just gave me a chance to take that 30,000-foot view and be able to reflect and then uh, add on to what is now the opportunity I've been given with the Padres. Carlos, so, you know, I'm, I'm so happy for you and, and proud that, that you get this recognition. Let me ask you, I look at your path. When I look at managers, you look at the path they've, they've ventured down, you know, and that was obvious when I first heard about you, whether it be a player, whether it be a coach, whether it be a bench coach, whether it be in New York, whether it be in winter ball, whether it be in the minor leagues. When you look back at your path, which one of your jobs do you think prepared you the most for what you basically went through this year? Yeah, first of all, what an honor is for me to be sitting here in front of you guys and with so many great baseball minds. But I would say every stop along the way helped me kind of prepare for this position. You know, whether it was a coach, a fourth coach in the minor leagues, whether it was a man manager in the minor leagues, uh, managing in winter ball in the fall league, A ball, and then, you know, as an infield coordinator, field coordinator, big league coach, uh, big league bench coach, I think you learn a lot from a lot of the people, whether the manager you're working for, the players, the coaches, the front office. So I would say every stop along the way kind of helped me uh, get into this position. Murph, it's Ron Darling. Congratulations to you and the organization. It's great to talk to you. You know, when I was a young kid and managers, um, I always thought that the teams mirrored the style um, of the manager. And I really felt like your Milwaukee Brewers team did that, stealing bases, catching everything, had a toughness and intelligence when they played. Did that come from you, or you just have those kind of players? No, we had a great group, young energy, a great leader in Yelich. Uh, he was tremendous leading those guys. He really found himself as a leader. You know, the front office supplies you with what you need. I've got a great coaching staff. You know, I, I'm just lucky to be part of it. I, I really mean that. Carlos, you had a, a watch what you wish for moment. You guys are 22 and 33. You're scuffling. You decide to move Lindor to the leadoff spot. When you thought about managing for the first time, you couldn't imagine that it would start like that. But you didn't lose um, any patience, any confidence. You really were the same in May as you were in August and September. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you never expect to to get off uh, the type of start that uh, we got off to, but it's a, it, you have to understand it's a long year. You know, it's 162 plus. At some point throughout the year, you're going to go through rough stretches. And for us, it was right out of the gate. And uh, I knew we had good players. I knew I had really good coaching staff with a lot of experience. Uh, and you got to give all of, the guy, all of those guys credit and because uh, they were the one that turned it around, you know, whether was Lindor moving to the leadoff spot. And the, we had so many things going our way. But again, I think it starts with having really good players, really good coaches, really good support staff. And I'm just grateful uh, to be around and, and, and being able to go out there and compete with, with all of them. You know, Mike, uh, congratulations. But I do want to say, you know, it stung me a little bit when you were let go in St. Louis. And I don't want to talk about vindication or whatever. It falls underneath the no, you know what. I got that. But I you know I look at the job you took, and the word was, I heard was toxic clubhouse, which I don't think was necessarily fair. I know there were a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that everybody doesn't know about. But I thought the, the smooth sailing and the kind of calming the waters and have them constant, this, the baseball being the focus, how do you feel like uh, you guys accomplished that? Yeah, I think, um, Buck, appreciate that. Um, no question that, first of all, it was overblown. You know, this clubhouse, I was a part of it to Greg's question earlier. There wasn't a toxic situation in our clubhouse in 2023 here with the Padres. Um, so a lot of that was overblown. So I came from a good place with a connection with players, partnered with the players, and then got it to be about playing baseball, making sure our players enjoyed themselves. And um, Sparky Anderson always talked about the number one thing he, he wanted was to make sure when the players were driving the ballpark, they were they were looking forward to getting there. Um, <laughs> just create that atmosphere. The staff was fantastic creating it. Um, entire staff, medical performance, clubhouse, everybody just got on board and 
created an environment was welcoming and it was about winning baseball games and fundamental baseball. And we had a lot of our pillar guys, Manny, Crony, Toddy, Musgrove, Darvish, Bogey, you know, met with those guys and they created the standards of what we we're going to be about. And, you know, you've had Manny and you know what he's capable of and the type of heart he has. And, you know, he was a big part of, of this and, and I'm proud of his development and that groups. And, you know, after partnering with him, it was just about going out and playing good, solid, fundamental baseball and, and competing. And we added some really good pieces from AJ to do it. Mike Schill, Pat Murphy, Carlos Mendoza, three worthy finalists of this honor. Don't go anywhere. One of you will be named the 2024 National League Manager of the Year. Let's play the same game we played earlier with the AL Manager finalists. The adversity these guys had to overcome. It's a great conversation to have. That's next on MLB Network. We are just stating facts. Take a look at the last three manager of the year winners in the National League. Hey, I just want to caution all, anybody that loses tonight, it ain't the worst thing in the world, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it ain't the worst thing in the world. That's back with Buck Showalter <laughs> and Ron Darling. Let's talk about all three of these finals for NL Manager of the Year. And, and the guy that, that replaced you uh, with the New York Mets, let's start there with Carlos Mendoza. You knew the intricacies of that organization and that job as well as anybody. Uh, how difficult was this battle for him to get I, I was so proud of how he handled everything and, and the, you know the support you, you're always going to talk about the players but you know when things are a little self-inflicted you know if you're not playing good thank God it's not football can you imagine losing the first four or five or six games oh. of the Giants or the Jets oh they may have oh, I had to kept up with it okay they did. But, <laughs> stop 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 so but you know to keep things from snowballing and staying consistent and the players walking through there every day knew and what they were going to get from the manager wasn't like up and down and the team didn't play that way you know if, if you're on an even kill the team's going to follow your lead for the most part and and the good players play better you know when I think of uh, Carlos Mendoza the word that comes is authenticity mm. He's just a person that it just emanates from everything that he does in that clubhouse yeah hey, Edwin Diaz came back wasn't lights out uh, the starting pitching rotation didn't have as much swing and miss as other postseason teams did you think that it was eventually going to turn around were you confident watching the team early in April well I knew they weren't a team that was an 11 game under 500 team certainly you didn't know what was going to happen but the magic that they had from June forward really energized that fan base it was an incredible one of the most incredible New York Mets season ever when you talk about overcoming obstacles, I mean, what a script written for Pat Murphy, longtime bench coach of a guy that leaves to go to a division rival to take a record contract financially. Uh, oh, by the way, Corbin Burns, we're going to trade your ace before opening day. Woodruff, you're never going to see him pitch on the mound. Devin Williams, your best closer, is a fractured back, doesn't come half the season. Your best position player gets lost for the last 60 games. And Christian Yelich, I mean, it's crazy what he had to overcome, Buck. Well, speaking of authentic, you know, the one thing that will get sniffed out in a major league clubhouse is a phony. <laughs> Believe me, if you're not sincere, and I think the players fed off the fact that Pat had been there before. They knew what, what they were getting, and he didn't change anything. It was all of a sudden, I'm the manager. Now I'm going to take on a whole different persona. And there was a certain consistency in the way they went about their business. You never know what events will transpire to change your team. Yelich out. That moved Jackson Churio from right field to left field. Yeah. That's exactly when he took off. Uh, and I think I'm with you. You know, the bench coach has a different relationship with the players at times. Uh, but Pat Murphy is the kind of personality that uh, did not change. He's tough but also empathetic which you have to be if you're a big league manager. Yeah the Brewer fan base probably thought they were waving the white flag with all those moves. You're going to trade away Corbin Burns before opening day. Oh no I, I think the same could be said for Padre fans like you're going to take payroll 80 million dollars down from the year before Juan Soto we're going to trade you to the New York Yankees Josh Hader to Pricey for the back end of our bullpen and Blake Snell we wish you the best. We wish you the best in the NOS with the San Diego Padres had to overcome and, and what he was able to do one of the best seasons regular seasons in Padre history Mike Schilt had an impressive campaign. Well I, I think the thing that hit me was it wasn't about him. You know you could mm -hmm. tell that the players knew they were they were the the most important thing every day when he got up and came to the ballpark and there was no ego and the other thing that impressed me is he didn't never suppressed a personality. You know, in today's game, you've got to let them kind of That's be themselves great. a bit. Never suppress a personality. And organizationally, as you said, the award is an organizational award. 
Baseball is back in San Diego in such a huge way by their players, by the manager, and by the organization. This is a toss-up, man. Yeah. Again, this is this is not an easy call. Carlos Mendoza, Pat Murphy, Mike Schilt, three terrific managers who will be named the National League Manager of the Year. I'll be uh, hanging out with Joe Madden once again after the break for the big announcement live on MLB Network. Don't go anywhere. One award down, one more to go. Will it be Carlos Mendoza? Will it be Pat Murphy? Or will it be Mike Schiltz? Who will be your National League Manager of the Year? It's Greg Amsinger live in Studio 21. Once again, joined by a former three-time Manager of the Year, Joe Madden. Joe, we're going to cut to the chase, get right to it. Go ahead yes, and give sir. us the big announcement, bud. Okay, the 2024 National League Manager of the Year. You've utilized the word tough to describe him on several occasions, and he is as tough as he looks, we go way back. Mr. Pat Murphy, congratulations, brother. <laughs> well done, Joe. Is there anything else you'd like to say to Pat? Yeah, I missed the time when I first met you at Tennessee years ago when uh, we're doing a clinic and he's up on the stage eating uh, some kind of protein bar. I'm sitting in the back thinking to myself, who is this guy? The confidence was even uh, apparent back in 1994. I'm really happy for you, man. Congratulations. We've had so Thank many you, great conversations. And looking forward to our next sure episode. Have, man. Yes, sir. Thank you, Joe. I respect the heck out of you. All right, Joe Madden, thank you for everything you did for us today. You're the best. You got it, man. I want to jump right into the voting results to show you how Pat won this honor. 27 first place votes, a dominant performance, 144 total points. Mike Schilt finished second, Carlos Mendoza third. Tori Lavella did a terrific job with the Diamondbacks. And Rob Thompson of the Philadelphia Phillies finished fifth, your 2024 National League Manager of the Year. Pat Murphy joins us. Uh, Pat, congratulations. What does this honor mean to you? you well I'll tell you uh, it's been said before but it really is a you know an organizational thing from the ownership to the front office um, to the coaching staff uh, they all made me look good but n nobody more than the players you know they stepped up they're the right guys I mentioned Yelich before but we had other great leaders Adamas Hoskins you know w William Contreras they all stepped up and uh, showed those young guys how to play they were hungry and um yeah, we've got more to do. Uh, you know, Murph, I think you're a great example. Never overlook an orchid while searching for a rose. You know, you know, you, you got to say thanks to, to Craig for, for, for leaving, open up the job. But who's this behind you? He seems pretty in, intent on what's going on here. He's 10-year-old Austin. Um, <laughs> he gets it. He gets it. He's on his way. Does, does he critique you every night? Uh, not as much. He's not falling asleep when I have that 30-minute ah, drive home. Congratulations. You look back through all your stops, Thank whether you, it be Arizona State, Notre Dame, different places. Was there ever a point where you said, you know what, I think I really want to do this for a living. I think I can do it at the major league level. Um, you know, I, again, I didn't plan on this. It wasn't my path. But then uh, when I got with Counts and uh, I was supposed to be mentoring him, but yeah, he did a great job mentoring me, and uh, I learned so much about the big league game. And then when this, this all happened, uh, yeah, I was just really grateful. I, I don't know that I was I was ready. I don't know that I, that I ever feel like I can do it. But uh, just being grateful, go to work every day and show up and try to impact somebody. You know, Murph, it's also got to be great for the city of Milwaukee. You know, this season by many was going to be discounted, that it wasn't going to be a winning type season. It was going to be a rebuilding season. You and the players did not buy into that. Congratulations on that. Well, thanks, Ron. I think that's the key. Like, the, the guys wouldn't take that. They didn't care what anybody thought. They were going to go do their thing, and, and, and they did it the right way, and they, they were hungry. And uh, it's tough. It's tough when uh, you don't have a full belly and, and you're scratching to eat. Uh, it makes things a lot easier for the manager. So it all makes me look good, but what a great bunch of people we have. Jackson Churio uh, was a finalist for National League Rookie of the Year. I asked him about your relationship, being just 20 years old, and he really commended you for being so understanding of him. Uh, do you think your over 20 years of coaching 18 to 22-year-olds in the college ranks helped you jump into the sport when it's getting so, so much younger right now? Well, I think everything helps you. You know, uh, the other guys that spoke, you know, they, they mentioned that, like, Every stop helps you, but I think when you, you're working with such special guys like uh, Churio, like this kid, you know, he just, you talk about hungry, you know, he just gets it. 
and uh, he wants to be great, and he wants to do whatever it takes to be great. Um, and he's open, you know, for that guy to not think he knows everything, and he, he's open to that. And uh, and that's infectious. And then you got leaders like I talked about in that clubhouse that really make things go. You know, it's the first time the Milwaukee Brewers have ever had a manager of the year. Did you know that before tonight? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I got to be honest, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't think about that kind of stuff. Well, you're kind of etched in history now with the Milwaukee Brewers. Like, you're the first guy to pull this off. That's pretty cool, right, Pat? All right. If you say so, that's, that's <laughs> A humble superstar. Hey, congratulations. Uh, you're so fun Thank to hang out man. with and talk to. And I hope you're, you're going to have a party Thank plan. You. Is there a, a, the Murphy family going to a big dinner? What's, what's uh, going to happen? No, we got, we got 10 new, we got 10 new practice. We're going to be late if we don't get on the road. <laughs> here, so. wrap, let's wrap it up a little All bit. All right, Dad, we'll let you go. We'll let you go. Pat Murphy, congratulations, man. Thank you very much. And there you have your National League Manager of the Year. That's awesome. He's still a dad. I got to go to practice, man. It is what it is. Oldest first-time Manager of the Year winners. Pat, at, at 65 years old, uh, right behind Trader Jack, Jack McKeon, back in 1999. For more context as to what went down over the past hour, let's send over to Jack O'Connell, the Secretary Treasurer of the BBWAA. Jack, take it away. Thanks, Greg. After all these years, the Milwaukee Brewers finally have a Manager of the Year Award winner elected by the writers. Prior to Pat Murphy's victory, Brewers managers finished second in the voting seven times, including four times by Murph's predecessor, Craig Council, who's now managing the Cubs. Murphy is also the 10th Manager of the Year Award winner in both leagues who did not play in the majors. Stephen Vogt's election marks the third time in the American League and the tenth time overall that the award went to someone in his first full season as a major league manager. The other first year American League winners were the Rangers' Jeff Bannister in 2015 and the Twins' Rocco Baldelli in 2019. Back Thank to you, you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. You know, Buck, we just watched two guys win this honor for the very first time. You've won it four times. Uh, what are the emotions when you win this honor for the first time? I, I think you just feel so thankful to the people that allowed it to happen. You know, the players, the coaches, the front office. You know, it's such an honor to manage and, and work in the major leagues at the, at the apex of, of, of baseball. But I'm, I'm happy for them, and I hope they all understand to get to this level. And it now becomes what have you done for me lately world. And, and that's okay. You understand that. It's the job description. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you know when you go into it, you're supposed to be the last team standing. And it, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it's so rewarding. You know, both managers – each had 27 first place votes. That's unusual, right? It is unusual. For that vote to happen. And I just hope there's one thing. This is the only award I wish that they would include the postseason. I agree. Because all the managers are going to be in the postseason with the way the format is uh, formatted now. So let the postseason play, and maybe it'll change some views because the players, the managers of really good players, Never really get a chance. That's to a great the, idea, buddy. Right? Why That's not? That's a great idea. I, I had a great idea. I told Stephen Vogt when he was moonlighting as an analyst on MLB Network, oh. hey, man, you should do this for a living. He's like, actually, I think I want to manage. I'm like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> this is so much more fun than managing. Come on, Stephen. He could have done both. <laughs> <laughs> Look who's talking. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Buck Show to Ron Darling. I'm Greg Amsinger. Congratulations to Pat Murphy and that guy, Stephen Vogt, your managers of the year.